Of course not. Hello. All right. I just need to put in this comment. Guys, I know you're freaking out right now. So, and we. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. Nerds assemble. Here we are. Greetings. Hello, Hello, all. Hello, hello. Just pinning a comment, which is always a thing. Takes a moment. Hi, Ivy and Andren and Big Ben, and I'm just rhyming away, aren't I? Yeah, we got a ton yeah. of folk. Yeah. Oh. I always feel like I'm going to date myself, but there was that thing in Romper Room where the lady. Ba -da 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 -da, romper Room. It was Romper Room, wasn't it? I remember Romper Room. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Yeah. I was drunk. Just kidding. <laughs> At eight years old. It's that kind of show, everybody. Uh, groovy and great. So, hello, everyone. What an amazing show we have for you today. Um, welcome to Between Two Nerds. Uh, brought to you by Nerds Vote, your source for voter registration information, as well as chats with some of your favorite notable nerds. I'm J.P. Karliak. And I'm Courtney Taylor. <laughs> and we have an amazing guest today. Uh, he is an old friend and such a talented dude. Uh, and uh, you may know him from Overwatch or Resident Evil, or I know him personally from Wabbit. He played like this amazing like Yeti guy. It was so funny. But uh, he's also one of the creators of this little known thing called Critical Role. So we are pleased to welcome our friend and yours, Matthew Mercer. Oh, it's waiting, it's waiting, it's connecting, it's happening. Yeah! Hello! Hi, friend! <laughs> Hey, it's good to see you guys. It's good to see you. Darling! Darling! So welcome to our uh, our weird little talk show. Uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we basically just take all of the things off a shelf in Best Buy and try to make it work. Uh, <laughs> I know that all too well. Yeah, for real, for real. Uh, how are you doing? Let's go. It's been a minute. <laughs> it has been a minute. Miss, miss your faces terribly. This is... Yeah, for sure. It was amazing. Um, no, I'm doing, hanging okay. You know, adapting as best as we can in a very unique and uh, anxiety-ridden time, I guess you could say. <laughs> Putting it lightly, uh, yeah. Yeah, but we're, we're, we're hanging okay. Just keep keeping productive, holding things together, and just really, really anticipating the climb to November. Uh, yeah, aren't we all? Uh... <laughs> but you've done the most important thing, Matt. You've done the most important thing. You have welcomed a pupper into your home. <laughs> that we have. That we have. We've been, so been threatening for years. Everything to... is perfect and all right. See, there you go. We finally... We more than a few people, when we requested, like, what questions do you have for Matt? More than a few have been like, tell us about the bird and the dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it's been wonderful. Uh, I mean, Dagon, our bird, we've been with for almost a decade now, uh, and uh, she's amazing. Um, and then we've been wanting to get a dog for a long time, and we were just having a hard time finding the right opportunity. You really kind of want to push for a corgi, because that had been just kind of the love of both of ours, for me since Cowboy Bebop, and for Marisha since forever. And, uh, and it happened that we found a family in Studio City that had a litter right as this you know, the real thick of this quarantine kicked off. And so it was very much a kismet moment. And then we introduced Omar into our life. And now the two animals are slowly learning to live together. <laughs> are, okay, is the bird riding the dog yet? No, no, the bird is very unsure and very uh, judgmental of the dog. And the dog really wants to play wants to with the bird. <laughs> and the bird is too tiny for his age. So we're, um, it's a slow implementation process. I'm sure it'll take many years of Tears and hard work. <laughs> All right. Well, let me know when I will affix the tiny saddle to the corgi. Do not yeah, worry. Not. You'll be the first I, I message. Yeah. I mean, I think we all want to see that. Uh, but <laughs> at, least, at least there's just judgment and unsureness as opposed to like when you're trying to introduce cats together and you have to have a whole separate wing of the house. 
Right. <laughs> for like three yeah. months so they can smell each other through walls before they actually will not murder each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thankfully, not so bad. Not yet. I'll let you know if it gets to that point. Who knows what this Please keep us up with, with the breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping up with the Omar. That's what it's... Oh, <laughs> boy. So, um, so you're, you, got, you guys are still holding up in L.A., yeah? You haven't, you haven't run off to Idaho or something like some of our friends have. No, 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 no. We're still in L.A. We're still in the Valley, which has been, you know, great with the summer heat as of late. Uh, um, especially when the room that you have converted into your recording studio, so you can still do voiceover during a pandemic, uh, really doesn't get any air conditioning. So many oh, of these, yeah. mm -hmm. many of these sessions have been, uh, I guess we call them Bikram voiceover at this point. So it's been... Uh, so you're doing the clothesless option. Okay. Correct, yeah. The shirt stays on, because that's where the, uh, the camera is. Everything on. Right. They have to produce um, I've started, um, I play it kind of like um, a Southern woman in church. I've got a hand fan that I've just got going the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of works. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably should adopt one myself. <laughs> it's, from, it's from a drive and drag, actually. So. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, awesome. For those of you just tuning in, welcome to Between Two Nerds. This is a show brought to you by Nerds Vote, your source for voter registration information. I'm JP Karliak, and this is Courtney Taylor. Uh, and uh, we're so glad to have you today, and also our special guest, Matthew Mercer. If you have any questions for Matt, you could throw them in that little, some of you have already started, uh, that little question mark box down the bottom. We also have a few questions uh, from... Uh, some fans that have uh, thrown stuff on Twitter and Instagram. So we'll be peppering those in along the way. Great. Um, but uh, some questions of ours. Matt, have you been staying like positive, motivated, inspired during what could be called um, the apocalypse? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to be real, it's not always easy. Um, you know, uh, I'm like to be m more open about my mental health these days than ever before and uh at times it's really hard it's been a it's been a challenge and there are some days where me and marisha just kind of have to really intensely focus on self-care and trying to disengage from the chaos around us but not too long because as much as it hurts and as much as it sucks you have to stay engaged to exhibit and put your effort towards seeing a change um so, but to stay positive and stay healthy, a lot of it's been, well, introducing a wonderful puppy into our life um, that we've been meaning to for a long time. Omar's been a, a source of joy. Um, taking care of others remotely. We've been, we've been doing a few like package drop-offs for friends of ours that are having a hard time on their like doorstep to see if they're doing okay. And some friends have done that uh, for us as well, which has been really sweet. Um, and, <sighs> I've been doing a lot of painting, a lot of like miniature, mini painting. Uh, oh, cool. not, not, not classic art painting, like, you know, legitimate artists. Um, okay. um, or the legitimate penny, mini painters that do a great job. I just, I find my, my Zen moment is sitting down with a small little creature or character and bringing it to life through color. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is, it is a very, very Zen thing. I just, I find so, like, Courtney and I have been doing some um, postcard writing. Oh, yeah. And sometimes, like, the Zen aspect of, like, writing the same thing on a postcard. It's almost like doing punishment assignments from the third grade. <laughs> totally. Just writing the same thing 500 times, but not in a punitive way. Like, in a very just Zen, like, you know, just, just handwrite. And, like, you don't even have to think about it at a certain point. It's just, like, this is my message. And, yeah, it's very peaceful. I can totally see that. Yeah, there is something about, like, ritual repetition that can, in the right circumstance with some nice nice music, mm -hmm. um, can really just kind of help center yourself. It is, it is a form of meditation, but also constructive. Yeah. I'd be interested if um, Enya album sales have gone up during all of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, both for the, both for the purpose of, uh, of keeping us calm and to play when the world finally has its death moment. We can do this slow-mo. Oh, yeah. slow -mo. Cinematic fall be perfect because we love irony. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Amazing. Um, somebody just asked the question. Um, what? There's somebody that is about to become a, D, a do uh, to be a DM for the first time in about an hour. Oh wow! 
Can you give them a full crash course? No. Uh, do you, if you had if you had one tip for a new DM, what would it be? Oh, one tip. I would say make sure make sure you listen to your players. It's very easy to get caught up in your preparation and the stress and the anxiety of trying to prepare. But as long as you're attentive and present, the players and their, their questions they'll ask, the actions they take, they'll inspire and guide the narrative where it's going. Right. Um, many cases, ignoring a lot of the preparation you did, but uh, like, like any and similar to improv class, you know, the more you are stuck in your preparation, the less present you are and the less real kind of magical dynamic and creation can happen. Um, you know, you've done the preparation as much as you've been able to, that's not going to change. You hold on to that and just get ready to set the scene for the players and let them carry the story and react to them. Go with your instincts and ideas based on what they do. And that I think leads to the most fun because otherwise you get too up in your head and, you know, primarily it is about what you create together. So just be attentive. Don't get stuck in your head and, you know, listen to them and follow where your heart takes you from there. That's great. There's some good life lessons in there, too. So much of it is based on oh. improv and that you could really, you know, utilize, um, you know, taking an improv class. Like, we talk so much as voice actors about, like, people ask that kind of stuff, like, what should I do? And we, we talk about uh, improv and the importance of taking scene study classes and all that kind of stuff. But there's so many great improv books um and resources out there as well so i uh just building on that it would seem like you could you could look up some of the resources around like ucb and ios and all the i mean jp you've done a million improv things but um I, like there's a book that, anymore, the, was this like how to be the, the greatest improviser on earth things like that seem like they might be helpful too that's pretty cool oh tremendously uh, i mean it's funny my time growing up playing role-playing games helped me be ready to learn improv. And conversely, the things I learned in improv helped make me a better dungeon master <laughs> and player. Um, I mean, it's so much about sharing the energy and the scene with a person, even just on stage or in front of a camera, is listening. And a lot of people who don't have that kind of training feel the pressure of bringing what they've prepared or what, they're, what they believe they're supposed to do to the table and concentrating on that aspect. And preparation is important but the key is finding a level of comfort with your preparation so that when the time happens to actually make something, you can let that go and just be present. And there's, there's, that's where the real magic happens. Yeah, for sure. We, we did have somebody that asked uh, what the percentage of prepared material versus improv goes into DMing. That varies widely from session to session sometimes yeah. you know and how much you want to prepare i've played a lot of sessions where i'm just you know by the seat of my pants making up shit as i go um as the years have gone on in critical role itself as a uh, a game uh, the preparation is a lot more extensive largely because the internal consistency of the world building is now being picked apart by hundreds of thousands of people week to week and you know they will find plot holes they will find you know, issues, people find inconsistencies, and they will shout out from the mountaintops. And that makes me very self-conscious. So, uh, <laughs> it doesn't so add to the anxiety at all. <laughs> yeah. So I do a lot of preparation for the sessions to make sure that all of that is taken care of and to kind of, you know, bring it to a level uh, that I think is worthy of the audience that has found us now and my players who are, you know, I want them to just be able to run free and be crazy. But you don't need that for your home game because your players aren't going to be, you know, meticulously pulling apart your world building they're too invested in the moment and wanting to play their character and interact and do crazy heroic things or stupid silly things and succeed and fail together so um it's really up to what makes you comfortable once again when you get to that table how much preparation makes you feel confident that you're ready for some people it's a lot of preparation and having that you know at the ready that is comfortable for some people you need you don't need much at all and you just jump in and see what happens so it it's it really is tailored based on what you think is best for you and you can only really figure that out by jumping in and trying so if you haven't dm'd the first session might be a disaster but as long as you're present and you're having fun you'll learn a lot about what makes it the right way to prepare for you that's awesome um we had uh, a few people that have asked um from various 
different uh, of different identities and uh, uh, people that have uh, various disabilities and illnesses and stuff like that that are talking about, can you represent me in this campaign or that campaign? When it comes to representing the real world and the and the the facets of people in the real world in your campaigns, like. How do you do that decision? Because you have like you've had queer characters, you've had all sorts of representation in your um, in your campaigns. Like, how do you make have that decision making of of you know what somebody's going to be like from thing to thing? No point. Um, well, to start off, I can always do better, um, and I'm always learning. And we all do, yeah. of course. Um, but that is for me. It's not so much trying to create. Uh, an allegory or an analogy of the real world as much as it's just making a world that reflects what I want to spend time in and reflects the world that I would like to be part of. And that involves a wide variety of people. Um, and as that continues, it's less about deciding this character is going to be representation, but when I'm creating NPCs, sometimes that just comes up, comes out naturally. You create the personality, you create their, 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 you know, disposition and what they do and where they're from. And then you're like, you know, and they're, uh, they're trans, you know, and it, it just kind of, it, it, a lot of times it just kind of speaks to me as I'm creating the NPC. Um, and then sometimes it is an intentional thing where I'm like, oh man, I've been really bad about, you know, being caught in a very standard way of, of world building. I need to bring a little more representation and diversity to the space. Um, so it varies from place to place. And, you know, I'm still, learning to be better and, and focus more on those endeavors as I go forward. But um, yeah, largely it's just, I just wanted to reflect the world that I, the world that I want it to be because it's the world that I wish ours was, so. Sure. I mean, speaking of your M NPCs, uh, when uh, Courtney and I uh, crashed Everything is Content a couple of years ago and we talked about our ballot parties, uh, we pit some of your NPCs from campaign one and two against each other in a faux election. If I remember, I think Kumat Sol was doing pretty well amongst yeah, all Yeah, he would. <laughs> Do you have, um, is there a current NPC that's been created since then that you're like, oh, would make a great politician? Oh, yeah. And none of them I would vote for. <laughs> uh, but they would make great politicians. That's a very specific skill set. That uh, the, sure. some, some of the best tend to not be the most uh, morally aligned with me. Um, but uh, I think, hmm, this is a good question. I think if I, if I had to choose somebody who had the best skill set forward in the right disposition, I'd probably put my, cast my ballot in for Arcanist Allura by Soren from uh -huh. both campaigns, actually. She's a, 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 a wonderful, experienced ex-adventurer now member of the Taldora Council, who is well-versed and well um, steeped in the political structure, both of Taldori specific and now other political structures around the world. Um, but she also has a good heart and a good head on her shoulders. And I would, I would definitely feel confident thrown into that hat, so. Okay. Very cool. Very, very cool. We're, uh, we're uh Oh, go ahead. Jamie Burke ninety one is asking actually, uh, just to bring it back to a little bit of voting. Matt, what is your voting plan? As much as you can say, certainly um, coming up on November third, and then also moving forward past November third into the future. Do you have a particular plan that you do every time? Are you doing something special for this time? And obviously, you know, going forward, what what are you foreseeing in the future as far as the style of voting that you'll be doing. Correct. Uh, previous years, uh, with where I currently live, there's an elementary school not that far down the road that has a voting center there. And so for previous years, it's always been going to that particular school, waiting in line, uh, and, and getting that taken care of. Um, which, even before all that, research. You got to read up on it, you know? It, a lot of people think of an election as like, well, you're just voting for one person in office. No. No, and honestly, in a lot of ways, it's more important on the state level that you vote for everyone who's more local in your election when you have the opportunity. So for no matter what the election, whether it be presidential or, you know, even city council stuff, you know, engage where you can and, and do your reading, do your research. Uh, me and Talison in particular have kind of a good uh, relationship where, you know, 
he, him more than anybody I know, like puts together a preparation packet for an election, sends it out to friends. And then those of us who are doing our own research then kind of cross-reference what he's put together and, you know, make sure you do the research, not just from one source as well. You want to make sure that you're looking from different angles and different perspectives so that you can make the most informed decision for what your values are as a person. Um, so doing that this year, um, however, am doing it uh, by ballot, by mail, because I want to be as safe and healthy as possible. Sure. Um, so that is, and, and, uh, and it's, I've, that's been set up pretty well in California, so I'm not necessarily worried. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's my current plan. And I think anyone who's here or has been following me has a very clear idea of the direction I will be voting. <laughs> Eggs. As Talison would put it, uh, uh, to, to quote him, you know, I lean so far left, I walk with a limp. <laughs> fair, fair. Kind of go in a circle is what you do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> also, just to interject, too, that um, we have a little giveaway that we'll be talking about later we regarding do. your voting plans. Not you, Matt, because I don't know that you need what we'll be giving away. Possibly. But, um, but just JP, a preview. Maybe something it's a smidge it's some of these beautiful things uh our pals at the rook and the raven yeah. will be uh donating a uh a dungeon master journal and two campaign journals in a little bundle uh that you can win uh we're going to have a post on our nerds vote instagram uh after this stream so make sure you visit it and follow the rules they're not that hard uh, but it involves just kind of putting out your voting plan and you can win. And the contest only lasts until midnight tonight. So this is going to happen all real fast. You're not going to have to wait months. Um, so, uh, and while Thanks, Rick and Raven. You're awesome. They're so cool. You guys are amazing. Um, while we're talking about voting plans, so uh, just so all y'all out there can make your own, um, there's a few things you need to do. You need to research your candidates, as Matt talked about. Decide how you're voting, whether in person or absentee. And also, if you are going to vote in person, and voting in person is not the worst option. As a matter of fact, if you have early voting where you're at, that might be a better option because there'll be barely anybody there. You can get in and out safely. And you can also make sure that, like, one of the things that's probably going to happen with this election is that certain there'll be votes that will be counted, like, up until election day, uh, up until and including election day are the ones that are in person. And then the mail-in ballots will take a little while to be counted. So if you want to make sure that whatever your favorite news program announces your ballot that night, then voting in person is a great bet. If, however... Get that first. Get that first. Mm -hmm. If, however, um, like me, I am also going to be voting mine absentee because I need to keep these cords healthy and safe, um, uh, be sure to uh, register for an absentee ballot, do your research as Matt described, and also do it before you get that absentee ballot. So as soon as you get that thing in the mail, you can fill it out and send it off. And also make sure that you read the instructions because every state is different and some of them are real particular. Like for instance, you have to use blue or black ink. I would love to use pink or purple, but hey, it's America. So, uh, <laughs> so use blue or black ink. Uh, yeah, so um, register to vote. We have, you can register at nerdsvote.com. You can also request your absentee ballot there. Make a voting plan like we described and vote. And also bonus points. Uh, if you wanted to fill out your census, if you haven't already, the census is super important in making sure that your community gets the resources that it needs. And also to make sure if you, uh, no matter what community you belong to, whatever your race, or you, if you are in a queer couple, a like a married couple, you want to make sure that you're on the census because our, the resources to our communities is determined through that. So be sure to do that. That's my preaching for right now. Um, Matt, do you have a, um, like an early voting memory or like the first time you voted? Like, Yeah, for me, it was, it was the, 20, uh, the 2000 election. I just turned 18 okay. mm -hmm. um, after graduating high school. And I was very invested in, you know, all my various history classes and spoken with one teacher in particular, my high school, Mr. Busby. We had an extensive conversation about the importance of voting and being engaged with local politics and national politics. And so because of those conversations, I 
was very excited to to finally have the right to engage and be a part of the part of the the adult voting de democracy system. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember uh, going, and this was up in, I think my voting area was up in the Thousand Oaks area, because I went to Agora High School and was living in Agora High at the time. And uh, it was either like north of Agora, it's one of the ele elementary schools are a big place where a lot of these uh, polling locations are placed at. So it was another school and it had a very long line. I remember waiting for like two hours to get through, but it was like an excited period of, of time. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of on my own, got dropped off because I didn't have a car yet. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just got to listen to a lot of very unique conversations and people bickering around me about their different political views and just have their quietly like, oh man, this is what it's like. This is gonna be great. And went in there and was, was some, I don't know, for some reason I had this very like dramatic idea of what a polling place would be like. I had like, like the pillars and columns and banners. Right, and right. Or like, <laughs> like the booths, at least in a lot of films and media, they're like these larger booths with full curtains that you close. And it's like this, this endeavor. And I went there and it was just like a little cubby. And I remember going like, huh. You know, that's yeah, the, cur uh, the curtain ones are the East Coast. Matt King was on on Tuesday and we were comparing <laughs> notes about our curtain voting booth experience. <laughs> yeah, it, it was very, it was, it was it, knowing what I know now, it was very much a, a nice dis disillusionment to, uh, to what that election was going to be for me. But, um, but nevertheless, it was kind of going in there, con confining myself to this little cubby and then stamping it. For some reason, I thought it was going to be more like a Scantron sheet, because that's what I was used to getting out of high school, and then having the little, you know, little pen push elements. It was, it was fun in the fact that it was less than I expected it to be, but also perfect, because it was just exactly what it should be. Yeah. <laughs> that makes even sense. Exactly. Uh, because it's, I mean, it's cool, because you walk out of the very like, wow, I made an important decision today, but it's not... Once you've done it, you've been like in the little cubby with a little piece of paper, it's like, this isn't as overwhelming as it all seems at the get go. It's just like, no, I just came in here and filled out a piece of paper for 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. And got a sticker. Got a sticker. Yeah. And, and to that also, point too, I'm talking about doing the research. In the chat, uh, there's a couple of mm. people who are saying that they've just missed the deadline for voting. And I just want to say to people who are too young to vote, it doesn't mean that you're too young to use your voice. Um, you are a pre-voter. And you can call your representatives, you can use ResistBot, you can just look them up on the internet, um, and you can call or text or use social media to reach out to your representatives and tell them what you believe in, what you want to see, and let them know that even though you're not voting this year, you're going to be voting, and you're paying attention now, mm -hmm. because they are tracking that kind of stuff. So if you call and say, hey, I'm 17, but you know what, I'm voting in two years for my uh, congressperson, that kind of stuff, it does have value. So don't feel like if you're under 18, there's nothing you can do because your opinions and your voice matter. Yeah, oh, very you can much even so. do phone banking if you want to, you know, it, it varies. Also, if you're 15 or older, uh, let's say your parents haven't gotten around to filling out the census yet and they're like, oh, I'm just so busy. If you're over 15, you can fill it out and send it back. It's like five questions. It's really not that big a deal. So if with their with your parents' permission, with your parents' permission, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, you you can sign it and send it back in as a member of the household. So do that. Cool stuff. And also, I am just loving these. Everybody in the chat, Vice Roy Craig says, "Don't forget, people, voting is great, but so is running for local office yourself. It's not for everyone, but it's another way for civic duty." And it's true. We talked about this last episode with Matt King about how, uh, you know, politics had this mystique up until a few years ago. And now it is being made available to a lot of people and people are being able to see themselves reflected in who's um, representing us at the local and state level and uh, national level. So, so please consider it. You know, you it you deserve to steer this ship as well, either through voting or through through running, raising your voice. Um, this is all this we started Nerds Vote to to do this to make um, this kind of action available to people that we felt did not always were not always welcomed into the conversation on a lot of levels. And so, you know, as nerds, 
storytellers, people who know about good and evil and heroes and doing the right thing and solving puzzles and, and you know, being problem solvers, we want you to use your voice and, you know, find ways that you can stay engaged, not just during an election year, not just for the presidential election, but all the time year round on every level. You matter. Your voice matters. Yeah. And, and to play off that, um, and I mentioned it earlier, but it's the local elections are far more important than most people give credit for. Um, no matter what party is in power, they largely will only adjust and change legislation towards the majority of states pushing for that change or making those changes on a local level. You know, mm -hmm. if there is, if, if there is a, a right way to shift existing legislation for the betterment of society and what we, how we want to see the world evolve in the future, it's much harder to get that change done on a federal level at the get-go. You have to make those changes on a local, community, state level, and the more that happens in that degree, the more it forces the federal level to change and adjust. So do not forget how important local elections are, please. Yeah. And one of the great resources that we promote uh, is BallotReady.org. Uh, we will put them in the chat. Uh, but uh, they're an amazing website that we're partnering with that provides unbiased, nonpartisan research on every candidate and measure ballot in the country up to a certain population level. So if you live, like, if you're like one of five people that lives in like a, you know, huge, huge area. Look in Bach, Texas. Yeah. Um, they're getting to you. They might not have you on the website yet, but they're filling it up. But it is a great resource, especially if like in California, you're like us and your ballot is like yay long and there's judges and also and ballot measures and stuff that you're just like, uh, I don't know. Um, they have the research for you so you can make an, a, a decision. So, yeah. Um, Matt, uh, we got a, an awesome question from, uh, oh, I, sorry, it's, it's half past the hour, I should do this. Hi, everybody, welcome to Between Two Nerds. <laughs> if you're just joining us, this is a show brought to you by Nerds Vote, uh, where we provide you voter registration information and chats with some of your favorite notable nerds. Today's guest is uh, the amazing Matt Mercer. Uh, and, uh, oh yeah, if you uh, would like to dress like Courtney or myself, uh, feel free, or uh, I do have to throw this one up. We have an amazing design provided by Karen Hallian, who's an amazing graphic designer. Uh, if you go to cons, you probably know who she is. Yeah, she we have all this kind of awesome cool t-shirt design. Um, you can get them either on our website, uh, which is nerdsvote.com, or you can go to redbubble.com to buy like notebooks and shower curtains and mini skirts and all sorts of stuff with our designs. Cause you know, we all need a mini skirt with voting. Um, I do. Yeah. Um, and all of the proceeds from that benefits our ability to spread the word. We have an amazing social media manager who needs to get paid. We like to pay the people. So uh, it, it all goes to the cause of, uh, oh yeah, there's Ivy right there. So just put ballotready.org in the chat. Ivy and the spooky kids. Thank you, Ivy. Um, yeah, so be sure to get some merch from us. Um, Matt, we got an awesome question from Harry Oranges uh, of Instagram. Excuse me? Uh, Harry Oranges? Paging Harry Oranges. No. Um, and he asks, how do you engage in a political conversation with people who have completely different beliefs than you? Uh, it's challenging and more challenging every year depending on where you are and the people you're conversing with for sure I have, I have family on the east coast that i haven't talked to in 10 years because of political differences um differences in the ideas of, of you know social justice and, and equality um so one you can't expect it to always be the right time or the right scenario to make that conversation happen but if you really want to have that conversation, you have to come at it as a conversation, not an argument. You have to be able to listen. Even if you vehemently disagree with what's being said, showing and extending enough respect to listen to what somebody believes in is the beginning of starting a conversation. And understand too, a lot of people's values are, you can't really tell them in a conversation that their values are wrong. You can, you, can, 
you can help understand that perhaps the ramifications of voting with a certain value can cause harm in other places and talk around that. But if you come at somebody immediately out of the gate with your value is wrong, there is no conversation. Sure. Um, unfortunately, that is a lot of discourse on social media. It's a lot of discourse in media. Um, it's challenging, especially in these very charged political times. So for me, and I've, I've had these conversations. Um, it's, it's about coming from a place of listening, being calm, even if you disagree with it, and just wanting to understand why it is that somebody believes things that you don't agree with. And at the base of that, you'll usually find it is an unrelated value that they have either learned or, you know, culturally believe in that tangentially through media, they have attached to something that you really disagree with. You know, a lot of people are afraid about their, their, their businesses. A lot of people are afraid about, um, you know, being unheard if they're not in a larger metropolitan city. And so that value, unfortunately, gets preyed upon by some politicians in a very negative light and can easily garnish people of those values to agree with things that they don't realize are far more damaging to like marginalized communities. And um, it, it's, it's trying to find the, the real core values that push in that direction. And you can't get to those points without a conversation. And you can't also expect there to be a changed mind at the end of this. A lot of times these conversations are just about understanding. And you have to be okay with that, you know? And through more conversations down the line, you can both come to understand each other better, more where you're coming from. And you'll learn something, they'll learn something. And hopefully in time, that is how a lot of discourse is done going forward. We've kind of lost that aspect of it. And there are some people that come in that conversation from a very not healthy place. And, and you have to also have to understand that that is okay to not engage with. Um, you do not have to give everybody uh, the benefit of the doubt and give them the ear to listen to if they're not willing to come and meet you halfway with respect. So anyway, yeah. I can go on and thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the hard parts of social media is like, I mean, my, if my partner's watching, he's gonna shoot me. But you know, sometimes he's like, oh, they're just, you know, and I had to say, it's like, you don't, you don't have to sit. Facebook is not going to, your diatribe on Facebook is not going to change the world. If it does, I mean, I'll be shocked. But like, you know, so going after Aunt Sally on Facebook is just, it doesn't, it doesn't really change anything. Having a conversation with her, I, I mean, my ability to have, to see what some relatives have posted and then talk to them privately about like, hey, this is kind of offensive to me and this is why, can we talk about it? As opposed to being like, full blast, everybody look at that, you know, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't change much. Um, well, somebody also mentioned in the chat too about, uh, you know, how it's always made personal, but I think that's one of the strengths of, um, of talking about opinions is because so much of the time people don't know, like they might not know your sexuality, your gender preference, or who you're dating or something like that. So if Aunt Sally is throwing something out there, um, she might be doing it because she doesn't think she knows anybody that kind of fits into that category. So if you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, not put her on blast and say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm dating a woman or, you know, this is, this is how I am in the world and this does affect me personally. Once that familiarity comes into play, I think people, you know, I, I had a really interesting conversation with somebody who was very upset about about me talking about um, um, clean energy resources and jobs. And they were like, hey, my dad's in coal. And that's why they were coming from that. And it, was, it turned into this really amazing conversation about, about where I didn't know anybody whose actual you know, parent livelihood depended on that. And it, it, we, we actually had a really great conversation about it. And I have this whole other window into things now. So it works both ways. It works no matter what side you're on. And I think, you know, we could all do with a little bit more, you know, acceptance of other people's humanity um, in trying to find ways for us to come together because that's how we're going to move anything forward is finding common ground. Yeah. And I, I, you know, if there's one of the things that's the hardest about this experience is 
we can't be in physical proximity to people. So it does feel even further distancing. I think one of the great things, kind of like you were talking about, Matt, of going to that elementary school, is you, it's, it's the moment where you're outside your bubble and you're hearing those discussions and I'm like, oh, okay, this is not, and not in a, in a screaming on Facebook kind of way, but people just expressing their honest concerns as they're going to the polls, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, like I'm from Pennsylvania and fracking is a big deal in Pennsylvania. I have a bunch of family members that work in it. Do I think it's the greatest thing in the world? Oh, absolutely not. But I do understand that a region that has been decimated after certain industries have left, when something else comes in, it's kind of like, well, you know, how do we survive? So, yeah. Um, one thing that we talk a lot about, Matt, is, you know, instead, we're a nonpartisan organization. We're a little different in person, but our organization is nonpartisan. <laughs> so we don't push parties or candidates. So when we ask you who you're voting for, we're not asking, you know, who is your candidate or party of choice. But when you go to the ballot, Matt, who, what people or issues are on your mind that you want that ballot to have a positive effect on? Indeed. Um, you know, preface this with the idea that I am... There, there are challenges with our system, even as a democracy. Um, you know, in some some cases, it's it's been an, it's been an oligarchy for a long time. But you work with what system you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, I vote. I vote from a place that will hopefully give more power to uh, voices that aren't heard, to uh, to listen to the terrible social issues with abuse and marginalized communities um, to, to, to not just point out issues with structures, but provide solutions at the same time. There's a very, very big, uh, long running thread in politics of pointing out problems and not providing an alternative solution for it. And um, that I, <clears throat> Man, there's a lot of things. Um, I, I'm a big fan of healthcare reform. Uh, I know because I've had friends and family who have died because they cannot afford to pay for simple medical procedures. Um, uh, I believe, and and will be voting because it's who I am from a place of empathy. Um, Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of research. I do, I do a lot of, of intake from media outlets from all perspectives, even those I very much disagree with because I want to be informed and I want to make sure that I have, uh, I have all the input and I can make my judgments based on that. Um, personally, for me, I, I do believe in uh, law enforcement reform and looking into getting people who are properly trained to deal with issues like mental illness uh, to handle a lot of issues that the police should not. Um, yeah, uh, I, and um, I, can, I can go on for a while. I'll stay with that for now. So I'm, I mean, there are a, number I, of, a number of things that are very important to me. I think, I, but I think you you really sum it up. I mean, it's all it's all important stuff. And the thing that's both amazing and unfortunate about this election is that everything feels dire. Everything feels like it's on fire. And um, as you said, you vote from a place of empathy and there's just so many issues where an empathic soul is just like, God, ah! you know. Um, so yeah, I totally feel you on that. Yeah, and, and you know, to, to, to go off my first point, this is an imperfect system with imperfect choices. Um, but I would prefer to try and make a difference within an imperfect system than not engage at all and not be a part of a possible change. Yeah. And it, it's so important too to talk about, um, and I see a lot of people in the chat that are talking about, you know, not voting Democrat or Republican or stepping away from it. And I just want to emphasize that I truly believe that if you want to change this from a two-party system to something else, that the work starts after the election, because this is something, if you want to create a system, if you really believe that, then not voting 
um, is not going to change that in this election. Um, these are, there are three years, you know, technically three years uh, in between presidential elections. And if you feel strongly about that, you have to take the load on during those three years, because to say now a couple of months before the election that, um, that, you know, that's a way to step out of it and create a third party. Just by not voting, you're not creating a third party system or a multi-party system. That does really require some work. And I hope and I strongly believe that it is possible to do something, but that the energy and the work happens um, in between. Yeah. And I mean, you know, uh... Courtney and I have talked about this a lot on the show, and we're we're all for a multi-party system. But you know, it as as she mentioned earlier, if you like getting out there and and running locally for yourself, you don't have to run as a Democrat or a Republican. You can run under anything, and at a local level, party system doesn't matter quite as much in most cases. So, and all parties are built from that local level. The strength of the foundation of those parties is built at that level. So if you're like, I can't stand either party, great, run as an independent, green, libertarian, whatever, and, or something else. And, you know, and push that agenda forward from the bottom up so that when we get to the next or the presidential election after, we can start having those really viable candidates. And also, to be fair, it also comes down to campaign finance reform because there's no way that we can get some good candidates on the ballot if they have to have, you know, bajillion dollars to do it. So, yeah. that, and we know that it is not actually a two-party system. Some people are correcting that in the chat, uh, but but it is generally comes down to two parties, and so that's at the presidential level. and even yeah. in Congress, and you know, we only have a, a handful of um, independents. independents um, in Congress or in the Senate. So yeah, it, it's ostensibly two party with other parties in there. Yeah, I would love to vote third party. And uh, unfortunately, I think with this climate, the polarization, how the media has run everything and just the, the window of time that we have, it does more harm than good to for me to do so right now. Um, but with an like you said, enough changes on a local level with starting to push and build better candidates and better alternatives to that on a smaller scale level and build towards, uh, God, with some real campaign finance reform. Um, oh, and I lost my phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. There was an earthquake from that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it means also uh, voting, you know, in every, we say voting is, uh, <laughs> is a lifestyle, not a trend. So it means voting every election, every time to start steering this bus. I'm using some of the analogies that people are using. Start steering this bus in the direction that you want to go. Um, we've also been told that we talk too much about politics here on Nerds Vote Between Two Nerds. So Max, what kind of ice cream are you eating these days? <laughs> Damn it. We always I, talk about food and we haven't even gotten there. And I'm a little concerned because we only have about five more minutes. So let's talk some chow. Oh. Fair enough. Yeah. Ice cream. Uh, there is a very specific flavor, a private selection, which is kind of the general brand at the Ralph's rest, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. groceries out here in LA. Uh, that is a, um, oh, fuck, what is it called? It's the, ah, oh, my brain is, oh, God, what's wrong with me? Um, is the base vanilla, chocolate, uh, fruity. Is no, it, it I, can't, I don't even know what the base is. Uh, what, have that. No, what, what, what's the name of the, the red cherries you put in drinks? Maraschino. Thank you. It's, it's kind of like a maraschino cherry ice cream where it actually has maraschino cherries, like half of them put in with it. And the flavor is kind of a loosely cherry flavor, but like in that kind of synthetic growing up childhood cherry flavor <laughs> with like little chocolate chips in it. So it's is it like amazing. White House cherry ice cream? Maybe. Are you having Shirley Temple ice cream? What Hell yes, I am. <laughs> and what other? You do not make a pukey sound because I know, J.P. Carliac, that you would totally eat. This man has never met an ice cream he does not like, so. No, that's not that. true. There's, there's, a, there's a couple. <laughs> there's, a, there's a, yeah. Um, He's like, there's one in the world. No, but I love cherry ice cream. And growing up, like, I would, I, I would go back and forth between, like, 
bit like dark Bing cherry ice cream is my fave. But I would also love to change it up every once in a while with White House cherry, which is like vanilla ice cream with bright red maraschino cherries in it. So it's basically an ice cream sundae without yeah. the chocolate sauce. But um, I guess. yeah. Cherry cordial is the flavor. Somebody in the chat found it. Cherry cordial. Ooh, delur. I recommend it. Guys, we're getting some we're getting some deep dive stuff that you don't know about now. Uh, we did have Science. one question that came in the in, in the chat that I that I have to ask. Okay. Now, what conditioner do you use? <laughs> None. I no. hate you. No, I. I it takes so much product to make my. <laughs> kind of shit out of no, I've I've been over this. I I I've always had scalp problems growing up. So my my shampoo regimen that usually involves like tea gel, which is like the oh yeah uh, the, coal, the coal based you know mm -hmm. elements there, and and some some uh, occasional medical stuff to help with that. But uh, but no, if I if I do conditioner, my hair is so fine that if I do conditioner, I immediately yeah, look like a member of Nirvana. It becomes a becomes a problem. I'm like garage band ready. Same girl, same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, mine is mine is basically ripped right from the scarecrow's belly, and uh, it, it is it is hay and. Uh, <laughs> My 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 stylist, yeah, she's like, how about this new fifty dollar product? Yes, give it to me. It's fine. I'll take it. <laughs> you can just come over to my house, and I will do your hair for you. I know. I've been doing punk rock hair my whole life. I know, girl. I know. She's afraid of my skills. I'll you jump guys, to manic whatever. panic eventually, but for right now, I'm seen me in high school. I'm fucking punk. I know. I know. I'm in desperate need of hair. <laughs> I've uh, not cut my hair since January, and I'm gone into like Fabio territory now. It's bad. <laughs> Yeah, because it looks the same, like, but are you, are you, like, doing the, the old Zoom conceal, like, oh, yeah. No, it's, it's just getting, it's getting too long for me, my taste. I like it a little bit shorter. But... I'm just starting to get banana clips and just, like, pull it all in the back. There you go. <laughs> oh, um, can we do one more, can we do one more um, um, question? Because I like this one very much. Not that I don't love seeing you guys all touching your hair, but um, exhaustion also known as break face face chain wanted to know if you had the chance to be a player instead of the dm in campaign three who would you want to play oh, oh no my brain just went in 17 different directions <laughs> i don't know um i would probably i would want to play an elderly non-wizard i know that that's a very classic everyone thinks wizard they think man with a gray beard and I think there aren't a lot of kind of older heroes represented in fantasy media. They're usually, you know, like 20 something, you know, fresh on the road. I want to play like a, like a, a retired cobbler who decides in his twilight years that he wants to go on an adventure and slay dragons. So like- yeah, Who's probably... closed up their shop? Who is a shopkeeper who has closed up their shop? <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be great, you know, and just, and just decided at that point, like, you know what? I think it's time I went and just followed the winds of my future, wherever they took me. Something like that. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, Matt, I do have to ask you this question. Mm. Is there a, a particular time of day that one should vote? This is a leading question. It's a leading question. It's specifically referring to one of your characters. Oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, you know, afternoon is good, morning is important, you know, and it can vary in the schedule. But if you, if you want to find that nice middle spot right in the middle, you just go ahead and find yourself there around <laughs> Thank you for taking the bait, my friend. I so appreciate it. Um, no okay. <laughs> it has been an amazing time having you. It's so good to see you, my friend. Um, you uh, just so everybody out there knows, uh, National Voter Registration Day is next Tuesday. We are so excited for this. So if you're not registered between now and then, please vote, uh, register to vote. Also make sure to check out our Rook and Raven post that's on at Nerds Vote. All you have to do to win one of these beauties is follow us on Instagram, comment in the post what your voting plan is gonna be, absentee, in person, early, uh, drop your ballot at a ballot box, blah, blah, blah. And then also share this post in your stories and tag Nerds Vote. All you have to do is that. You have until midnight Pacific to do it, and we will pick a winner tomorrow. Um, and...
on the 22nd, which is National Voter Registration Day, you thought we topped ourselves with Matt Mercer. <laughs> Part two of the awesomeness, our guest is Dolan North. Dolan Don't North! Tell hey. yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Don't tell anybody. It's just secret for you guys to know. Don't put it on the internet. Yeah, we won't come for you. Uh, <laughs> yes, so... Uh, be sure to tune in for Nolan North at 6 p.m. Pacific. Our Tuesday shows are a little later, just to accommodate the working schedule. Um, uh, Matt, uh, before we let you go, the way that we always ask our voiceover people to sign off is to pick uh, your favorite character that you do and tell our audience to get out and vote. Okay, my favorite. Um... Because if we clear it to the audience, it would be an onslaught. It would take hours to be like, oh my yeah, God. Noted, no. noted. Noted. I will, I will, I'll, t I'll take whatever, the, the, the personal, just in my, my, my whimsical mood that you guys have put me in voice and say, well, uh, it's been a great pleasure seeing y'all here. Thanks for joining us in this mighty fine conversation about the importance of voting in the upcoming election. Uh, Courtney, JP, love you and miss your faces. Respectfully, this has been a fantastic endeavor. And thank you all for joining us. Make sure you vote. <laughs> so good my friend thank you so much for joining us we miss you so much drop the phone again love you maddie and, love uh, you guys yeah we'll see thank you everyone bye. bye thanks so much for watching you guys tune in make sure that you enter our fabulous giveaway see you on tuesday at six with uncle noli yep and be sure to enter the Rook and Raven contest and to get our merch, because that thing is beautiful. All right, everybody. Right. And don't forget to vote. Register to vote. Get ready. Do your plan. Let's do this. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, guys.